Chapter Two of the Red Dust by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, The Journey. Darkness. The soft blanketing night of the age of fungoids had fallen over all the earth, and there was blackness everywhere that was not good to have. Here and there, however, dim bluish lights glowed near the ground. There an intermittent glow showed that a firefly had wandered far from the rivers and swamps above which most of his kind now congregated. Now a faintly luminous ball of fire drifted above the steaming, moisture-sodden earth. It was a will-o'-the-wisp grown to a yard in diameter. From the low-hanging banks of clouds that hung perpetually overhead, large warm raindrops fell ceaselessly. A drop, a pause, and then another drop, added to the already dank moisture of the ground below. The world of fungus growths flourished on just such dampness and humidity. It seemed as if the toadstools and mushrooms could be heard, swelling and growing large in the darkness. Rustlings and stealthy movements sounded furtively through the night, and from above the heavy throb of mighty night wings was continuous. The tribe was hidden in the midst of a tangled copse of toadstools, too thickly interwoven for the larger insects to penetrate. Only the little midgets hid in its recesses during the night-time, and the smaller moths during the day. About and among the bases of the toadstools, however, where their spongy stalks rose from the humid earth, small beetles roamed, singing cheerfully to themselves in deep bass notes. They were small and round, some six or eight inches long, and their bellies were pale gray and as they went about they emitted sounds which would have been chirps had they been other than low as the lowest tone of a harp. They were truffle-beetles, in search of the dainty tidbits on which epicures once had feasted. Some strange sense seemed to tell them when one of half a dozen varieties of truffle was beneath them, and they paused in their wandering to dig a tunnel straight down. A foot two feet or two yards, all was the same to them. In time they would come upon the morsel they sought, and would remain at the bottom of their temporary home until it was consumed. Then another period of wandering, singing their cheerful song, until another likely spot was reached, and another tunnel begun. In a tiny open space in the center of the toadstool thicket, the tribe folk slept with the deep notes of the truffle beetles in their ears. A new danger had come to them, but they had passed it on to Burl with a new and childlike confidence, and considered the matter settled. They slept, while beneath a glowing mushroom at one side of the clearing, Burl struggled with his new problem. He squatted upon the ground in the dim radiance of the shining toadstool, his moth-wing cloak wrapped about him, his spear in his hand, and his twin golden plumes of the moth's antenna bound to his forehead, but his face was downcast as a child's. The red mushrooms had begun to burst. Only that day one of the women, seeking edible fungus for the tribal larder, had seen the fat, distended globule of the red mushroom. Its skin was stretched taut and glistened in the light. The woman paid little or no attention to the red growth. Her ears were attuned to catch sounds that would warn her of danger while her eyes searched for tidbits that would make a meal for the tribe, and, more particularly, for her small son left behind at the hiding-place. A ripping noise made her start up, alert on the instant. The red envelope of the mushroom had split across the top, and a thick cloud of brownish-red dust was spurting in every direction. It formed a pyramidal cloud some thirty feet in height, which enlarged and grew thinner with minor eddies within itself. A little yellow butterfly with wings barely a yard from tip to tip flapped lazily above the mushroom-covered plain. Its wings beat the air with strokes that seemed like playful taps upon a friendly element. 
The butterfly was literally intoxicated with the sheer joy of living. It had emerged from its cocoon barely two hours before, and was making its maiden flight above the strange and wonderful world. It fluttered carelessly into the red-brown cloud of mushroom spores. The woman was watching the slowly changing form of the spore mist. She saw the butterfly enter the brownish dust, and then her eyes became greedy. There was something the matter with the butterfly. Its wings no longer moved lazily and gently. They struck out in frenzied, hysterical blows that were erratic and wild. The little yellow creature no longer floated lightly and easily, but dashed here and there, wildly and without purpose, seeming to be in its death throes. It crashed helplessly against the ground, and lay there moving feebly. The woman hurried forward. The wings would be new fabric with which to adorn herself, and the fragile legs of the butterfly contained choice meat. She entered the dust cloud. A stream of intolerable fire, though the woman had never seen or known of fire, burned her nostrils and seared her lungs. She gasped in pain, and the agony was redoubled. Her eyes smarted as if burning from their sockets, and tears blinded her. The woman instinctively turned about to flee, but before she had gone a dozen yards, blinded as she was, she stumbled and fell to the ground. She lay there gasping and uttering moans of pain, until one of the men of the tribe who had been engaged in foraging nearby saw her and tried to find out what had injured her. She could not speak, and he was about to leave her and tell the other tribe folk about her, when he heard the clicking of an ant's limbs, and rather than have the ant pick her to pieces bit by bit and leave his curiosity ungratified, the man put her across his shoulders and bore her back to the hiding place of the tribe. It was the tale the woman had told when she partly recovered that caused Burl to sit alone all that night beneath the shining toadstool in the little clearing, puzzling his just-awakened brain to know what to do. The year before there had been no red mushrooms. They had appeared only recently, but Burl dimly remembered that one day, a long time before, there had been a strange breeze which blew for three days and nights, and that during the time of its blowing all the tribe had been sick and had wept continually. Burl had not yet reached the point of mental development when he could associate that breeze with a storm at a distance, or reason that the spores of the red mushrooms had been borne upon the wind to the present resting places of the deadly fungus growths. Still less could he decide that the breeze had not been deadly only because it was lightly laden with the fatal dust. He knew simply that unknown red mushrooms had appeared, that they were everywhere about and that they would burst, and that to breathe the red dust they gave out was grievous sickness or death. The tribe slept while the bravely attired figure of Burl squatted under the glowing disk of the luminous mushroom his face a picture of querulous perplexity, and his heart full of sadness. He had consulted his strange inner self, and no plan had come to him. He knew the red mushrooms were all about. They would fill the air with their poison. He struggled with his problem while his people slumbered, and the woman who had breathed the mushroom dust sobbed softly in her troubled sleep. Presently a figure stirred on the farther side of the clearing. Saya woke and raised her head. She saw Burl crouching by the shining toadstool, his gay attire draggled and unnoticed. She watched him for a little, and the desolation of his pose awoke her pity. She rose and went to his side, taking his hand between her two, while she spoke his name softly. When he turned and looked at her, confusion smote her, but the misery in his face brought confidence again. Burl's sorrow was inarticulate. He could not explain this new responsibility for his people that had come to him, 
But he was comforted by her presence, and she sat down beside him. After a long time she slept, with her head resting against his side. But he continued to question himself, continued to demand an escape for his people from the suffering and danger he saw ahead. With the day an answer came. When Burl had been carried down the river on his fungus raft, and had landed in the country of the army ants, he had seen great forests of edible mushrooms, and had said to himself that he would bring Saya to that place. He remembered, now, that the red mushrooms were there also, but the idea of a journey remained. The hunting ground of his tribe had been free of the red fungoids until recently. If he traveled far enough, he would come to a place where there were still no red toadstools. Then came the decision. He would lead his tribe to a far country. He spoke with stern authority when the tribesmen woke, talking in few words and in a loud voice, holding up his spear as he gave his orders. The timid, pink-skinned people obeyed him meekly. They had seen the body of the Clotho spider he had slain, and he had thrown down before them the gray bulk of the labyrinth spider he had thrust through with his spear. Now he was to take them through unknown dangers to an unknown haven, but they feared to displease him. They made light loads of their mushrooms and such meatstuffs as they had and parceled out what little fabric they still possessed. Three men bore spears, in addition to Burl's long shaft, and he had persuaded the other three to carry clubs, showing them how the weapon should be wielded. The indefinitely brighter spot in the cloud banks above, that meant the shining sun, had barely gone a quarter of the way across the sky, when the trembling band of timid creatures made their way from their hiding-place and set out upon their journey. For their course Burl depended entirely upon chance. He avoided the direction of the river, however, and the path along which he had returned to his people. He knew the red mushrooms grew there. Purely by accident he set his march toward the west, and walked cautiously on, his tribesfolk following him fearfully. Burl walked ahead, his spear held ready. He made a figure at once brave and pathetic, venturing forth in a world of monstrous ferocity and incredible malignance, armed only with a horny spear borrowed from a dead insect. His velvety cloak, made from a moth's wing, hung about his figure in graceful folds, however, and twin golden plumes nodded jauntily from his forehead. Behind him the nearly naked people followed reluctantly. Here a woman with a baby in her arms, there children of nine or ten, unable to resist the instinct to play even in the presence of the manifold dangers of the march. They ate hungrily of the lumps of mushroom they had been ordered to carry. Then a long-legged boy, his eyes roving anxiously about in search of danger, followed. Thirty thousand years of flight from every peril had deeply submerged the combative nature of humanity. After the boy came two men, one with a short spear and the other with a club, each with a huge mass of edible mushroom under his free arm, and both badly frightened at the idea of fleeing from dangers they knew and feared to dangers they did not know and consequently feared much more. So was the caravan spread out. It made its way across the country with many deviations from a fixed line, and with many halts and pauses. Once a shrill stridulation filled all the air before them, a monster sound compounded of innumerable clickings and high-pitched cries. They came to the tip of an eminence and saw a great space of ground covered with tiny black bodies locked in combat. For quite half a mile in either direction the earth was black with ants, snapping and biting at each other, locked in vice-like embraces, each combatant couple trampled under the feet of the contending armies, with no thought of surrender, 
or quarter. The sound of the clashing of fierce jaws upon horny armor, the cries of the maimed, and strange sounds made by the dying, and above all, the whining battle-cry of each of the fighting hordes, made a sustained uproar that was almost deafening. From either side of the battleground a pathway led back to separate ant cities, a pathway marked by the hurrying groups of reinforcements rushing to the fight. Tiny as the ants were, for once no lumbering beetles swaggered insolently in their path, nor did the hunting spiders mark them out for prey. Only little creatures, smaller than the combatants themselves, made use of the insect war for purposes of their own. These were little gray ants, barely more than four inches long, who scurried about in and among the fighting creatures with marvelous dexterity, carrying off piecemeal the bodies of the dead, and slaying the wounded for the same fate. They hung about the edges of the battle, and invaded the abandoned areas when the tide of battle shifted, insect guerrillas, fighting for their own hands, careless of the origin of the quarrel, espousing no cause, simply salvaging the dead and the living debris of the combat. Burl and his little group of followers had to make a wide detour to avoid the battle itself, and the passage between bodies of reinforcements hurrying to the scene of strife was a matter of some difficulty. The ants, running rapidly toward the battlefield, were hugely excited. Their antennae waved wildly, and the infrequent wounded one, limping back toward the city, was instantly and repeatedly challenged by the advancing insects. They crossed their antenna with his, and required thorough evidence that he was of the proper city, before allowing him to proceed. Once they arrived at the battlefield, they flung themselves into the fray, becoming lost and indistinguishable in the tide of straining, fighting black bodies. Men in such a battle, without distinguishing marks or battle cries, would have fought among themselves as often as against their foes, but the ants had a much simpler method of identification. Each ant city possesses its individual odor a variant on the scent of formic acid, and each individual of that city is recognized in his world quite simply and surely by the way he smells. The little tribe of human beings passed precariously behind a group of a hundred excited insect warriors, and before the following group of forty equally excited black insects. Burl hurried on with his following, putting many miles of perilous territory behind before nightfall. Many times during the day they saw the sudden billowing of a red-brown dust cloud from the earth, and more than once they came upon the empty skin and drooping stalk of one of the red mushrooms, and more often still they came upon the mushrooms themselves, grown fat and taut prepared to send their deadly spores into the air when the pressure from within became more than the leathery skin could stand. That night the tribe hid among the bases of giant puffballs, which at a touch shot out a puff of white powder resembling smoke. The powder was precisely the same in nature as that cast out by the red mushrooms, but its effects were marvelously and mercifully different. It was innocuous. Burl slept soundly this night, having been two days and a night without rest. But the remainder of his tribe, and even Saya, were fearful and afraid, listening ceaselessly all through the dark hours for the menacing sound of creatures coming to prey upon them. And so for a week the march kept on. Burl would not allow his tribe to stop to forage for food. The red mushrooms were all about. Once one of the little children was caught in a whirling eddy of red dust, and its mother rushed into the deadly stuff to seize it and bring it out. Then the tribe had to hide for three days while the two of them recovered from the debilitating poison. Once, too, they found a half-acre patch of the giant cabbages. There were six of them full-grown, and a dozen or more smaller ones. 
and Burl took two men and speared two of the huge twelve-foot slugs that fed upon the leaves. When the tribe passed on it was gorged on the fat meat of the slugs, and there was much soft fur, so that all the tribe's folk wore loincloths of the yellow stuff. There were perils, too, in the journey. On the fourth day of the tribe's traveling Burl froze suddenly into stillness. One of the hairy tarantulas, a trapdoor spider with a black belly, had fallen upon a scabrous beetle and was devouring it only a hundred yards ahead. The tribe folk, trembling, went back for half a mile or more in panic-stricken silence and refused to advance until he had led them a detour of two or three miles to one side of the dangerous spot. Long, fear-ridden marches through perilous countries unknown to them, through the golden isles of yellow mushroom forests, over the flaking surfaces of plains covered with many-colored rusts and moles, pauses beside turbid pools whose waters were concealed by thick layers of green slime, and other evil-smelling ponds which foamed and bubbled slowly which were covered with pasty yeasts that rose in strange forms of discolored foam. Fleeting glimpses they had of the glistening spokes of symmetrical spiders' webs, whose least thread it would have been beyond the power of the strongest of the tribe to break. They passed through a forest of puffballs, which boomed when touched and shot a puff of vapor from their open mouths. Once they saw a long and sinuous insect that fled before them and disappeared into a burrow in the ground, running with incredible speed upon legs of uncountable number. It was a centipede all of thirty feet in length, and when they crossed the path that it followed a horrible stench came to their nostrils so that they hurried on. Long escape from unguessed dangers brought boldness of a sort to the pink-skinned men, and they would have rested. They went to Burl with their complaint, and he simply pointed with his hands behind them. There were three little clouds of brownish vapor in the air, where they could see along the road they had traversed. To the right of them a dust cloud was just settling, and to the left another rose as they looked. A new trick of the deadly dust became apparent now. Toward the end of a day in which they had traveled a long distance, one of the little children ran a little to the left of the route its elders were following. The earth had taken on a brownish hue, and the child stirred up the surface mold with its feet. The brownish dust that had settled there was raised again, and the child ran, crying and choking, to its mother, its lungs burning as with fire and its eyes like hot coals. Another day would pass before the child could walk. In a strange country, knowing nothing of the dangers that might assail the tribe while waiting for the child to recover, Burl looked about for a hiding place. Far over to the right, a low cliff perhaps twenty or thirty feet high, showed sides of crumbling yellow clay, and from where Burl stood he could see the dark openings of burrows scattered here and there upon its face. He watched for a time to see if any bee or wasp inhabited them knowing that many kinds of both insects dig burrows for their young, and do not occupy them themselves. No dark forms appeared, however, and he led his people toward the openings. The appearance of the holes confirmed his surmise. They had been dug months before by mining bees, and the entrances were weathered and worn. The tribe-folk made their way into the three-foot tunnels and hid themselves, seizing the opportunity to gorge themselves upon the food they carried. Burl stationed himself near the outer end of one of the little caves to watch for signs of danger. While waiting he poked cautiously with his spear at a little pile of white and sticky parchment-like stuff he saw just within the mouth of the tunnel. Instantly movement became visible. Fifty, sixty, or a hundred tiny creatures, no more than half an inch in length, tumbled pell-mell from the dirty white heap. Awkward legs, tiny greenish-black bodies, and bristles protruding in every direction made them strange to look upon. 
They had tumbled from the whitish heap, and now they made haste to hide themselves in it again, moving slowly and clumsily with immense effort and laborious contortions of their bodies. Burl had never seen any insect progress in such a slow and ineffective fashion before. He drew one little insect back with the point of his spear, and examined it from a safe distance. Tiny jaws before the head met like twin sickles, and the whole body was shaped like a rounded diamond lozenge. Burl knew that no insect of such small size could be dangerous, and leaned over, then took one creature in his hand. It wriggled frantically and slipped from his fingers, dropping upon the soft yellow caterpillar fur he had about his middle. Instantly, as if it were a conjuring trick, the little insect vanished, and Burl searched for a matter of minutes before he found it hidden deep in the long, soft hairs of the fur, resting motionless and evidently at ease. It was a bee-louse, the first larval form of a beetle whose horny armor could be seen in fragments for yards before the clay cliffside. Hidden in the openings of the bee's tunnel, it waited until the bee-grubs farther back in their separate cells should complete their changes of form and emerge into the open air, passing over the cluster of tiny creatures in the doorway. As the bees pass, the little bee-lice would clamber in eager haste up their hairy legs and come to rest in the fur above their thoraxes. Then, weeks later, when the bees in turn made other cells and stocked them with honey for the eggs they would lay, the tiny creatures would slip from their resting places and be left behind in the fully provisioned cell, to eat not only the honey the bee had so laboriously acquired, but the very grub hatched from the bee's egg. Burl had no difficulty in detaching the small insect and chasing it away, but in doing so, discovered three more that had hidden themselves in his furry garment, no doubt thinking it the coat of their natural though unwilling hosts. He plucked them away and discovered more and more. His garment was the hiding place for dozens of the creatures. Disgusted and annoyed, he went out of the cavern to a spot some distance away, where he took off his robe and pounded it with the flat side of his spear to dislodge the visitors. They dropped out one by one, reluctantly, and finally the garment was clean of them. Then Burl heard a shout from the direction of the mining bee caves, and hastened toward the sound. It was then drawing toward the time of darkness, but one of the tribesmen had ventured out and found no less than three of the great imperial mushrooms. Of the three, one had been attacked by a parasitic purple mold, but the gorgeous yellow of the other two was undimmed, and the people were soon feasting upon the firm flesh. Burl felt a little pang of jealousy, though he joined in the consumption of the find as readily as the others, and presently drew a little to one side. He cast his eyes across the country, level and unbroken as far as the eye could see. The small clay cliff was the only inequality visible, and its height cut off all vision on one side, but the view toward the horizon was unobstructed on three sides, and here and there the black speck of a monster bee could be seen, droning homeward to its hive or burrow, and sometimes the slender form of a wasp passed overhead, its transparent wings invisible from the rapidity of their vibrations. These flew high in the air but lower down, barely skimming the tops of the many-colored mushrooms and toadstools, fluttering lightly above the swollen fungoids, and touching their dainty proboscises to unspeakable things, in default of the fragrant flowers that were normal food for their races, lower down flew the multitudes of butterflies the age of mushrooms had produced. White and yellow and red and brown, pink, and blue and purple and green, every shade and every color, every size and almost every shape, they flitted gaily in the air. There were some so tiny 
that they would barely have shaded Burl's face, and some beneath whose slender bodies he could have hidden himself. They flew in a riot of colors and tints, above a world of foul mushroom growths and turgid slime-covered ponds. Burl, temporarily out of the limelight because of the discovery of a store of food by another member of the tribe, bethought himself of an idea. Soon night would come on, the cloud bank would turn red in the west, and then darkness would lean downward from the sky. With the coming of that time, these creatures of the day would seek hiding places, and the air would be given over to the furry moths that flew by night. He, Burl, would mark the spot where one of the larger creatures alighted, and would creep up upon it with his spear held fast. His wide blue eyes brightened at the thought, and he sat himself down to watch. After a long time the soft, down-reaching fingers of the night touched the shaded aisles of the mushroom forests, and a gentle haze arose above the golden glades. One by one the gorgeous flyers of the daytime dipped down and furled their painted wings. The overhanging clouds became darker, finally black, and the slow, deliberate rainfall that lasted all through the night began. Burl rose and crept away into the darkness, his spear held in readiness. Through the black night, beneath deeper blacknesses which were the dark undersides of huge toadstools, creeping silently, with every sense alert for sign of danger or for hope of giant prey, Burl made his slow advance. A glorious butterfly of purple and yellow markings, whose wings, spread out for three yards on either side of its delicately formed body, had hidden itself barely two hundred yards away. Burl could imagine it now, preening its slender limbs and combing from its long and slender proboscis any trace of the delectable foodstuffs on which it had fed during the day. Burl moved slowly and cautiously forward all eyes and ears. He heard an indescribable sound in a thicket a little to his left, and shifted his course. The sound was the faint whistling of air through the breathing holes along an insect's abdomen. Then came the delicate rustling of filmy wings being stretched and closed again, and the movement of sharply barbed feet upon the soft earth. Burl moved in breathless silence, holding his spear before him in readiness to plunge it into the gigantic butterfly's soft body. The mushrooms here were grown thickly together, so there was no room for Burl's body to pass between their stalks, and the rounded heads were deformed and misshapen from their crowdings. Burl spent precious moments in trying to force a silent passage, but had to own himself beaten. Then he clambered up upon the spongy mass of mushroom heads, trusting to luck that they would sustain his weight. The blackness was intense, so that even the forms of objects before him were lost in obscurity. He moved forward for some ten yards, however, walking gingerly over his precarious foothold. Then he felt, rather than saw, the opening before him. A body moved below him. Burl raised his spear and, with a yell, plunged down on the back of the moving thing, thrusting his spear with all the force he could command. He landed on a shifting form, but his yell of triumph turned to a scream of terror. This was not the yielding body of a slender butterfly that he had come upon, nor had his spear penetrated the creature's soft flesh. He had fallen upon the shining back of one of those huge meat-eating beetles, and his spear had slid across the horny armor and then stuck fast, having pierced only the leathery tissue between the insect's head and thorax. Burl's terror was pitiable at the realization, but as nothing to the ultimate panic which possessed him when the creature beneath him uttered a grunt of fright and pain and, spreading its stiff wing-cases wide, 
shot upward in a crazy, panic-stricken, rocket-like flight toward the sky. End of Chapter 2